History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno Lecture 24 Rationality and the Additional Factor February 11th, 1965 The day before yesterday I discussed with you the aspect of the consciousness of freedom that has its roots in the fact that the human subject has no knowledge of the internal causes of its own impulses, of what we might call its inner causation, In the process, I placed great emphasis on one element connected with the ego principle itself. This was the element of narcissism, since of course, and I might add from a psychological point of view, the mechanisms of repression discovered by depth psychology play a vital role, and in a psychogenetic sense, an even more essential one. This is because the conditioning factors, the blind conditions at which the subject box, are in fact the powers of the id, the repressed instinctual impulses. Repressed in this context means keeping something at a distance from the subject. This disguising of the unfree elements of subjectivity from subjectivity itself is caused, as you know from your reading in psychology, by the ego. A further factor is that the ego, which, as you know, has come into being as the authority of the personality as a whole, and which is responsible for overseeing reality, that is to say, It has the task of testing external reality to make sure that nothing bad happens to a person. A further factor then is that because of this task, this ego authority assumes something of a propensity to externalize. This is so closely identified with its ego impulses, in other words, the impulse to self-preservation, that it is only relatively late and only after a very high degree of differentiation has taken place that the ego arrives at a self-reflexivity that can be taken for granted every bit as much as the schoolmaster's statement in the Latin lesson. To take an example from everyday life, that the general conquers the city, or conquers the city. It is my belief that we ought not to take this primacy of the ego for granted, even though it has become something of an article of faith among philosophers. We might say that the fact that the ego operates coercively on the external world that it operates in an extroverted fashion, if if I may use this psychological term, prevents it from becoming aware of its own compulsive nature and the unfreedom of the principle governing its own freedom. I would remind you in passing that this compulsive nature of the subject, its unfreedom, has what I might even go so far as to call its ontological roots in the fact that, in its solidity and its determinate nature, the ego imitates the coercion that is imposed on it from without, so as to be able to combat it. I believe that this is something I have already told you about in some detail. In short, then, the subject's consciousness of freedom, his naive consciousness of freedom, is something like a web of delusion. The subject is trapped within itself. The name of the resulting delusion is that of its freedom as something that exists in the here and now, a quality that it ascribes to itself like other qualities. We could say that the human subject is bewitched by the idea of its own freedom as if by a magic spell, and this condition of being spellbound by one's own freedom, this inability on the part of the self-preserving subject to perceive the way it is conditioned as a consequence of this mechanism of self-preservation. This is something we might well describe as the metapsychological or, if you like, metaphysical truth of the Freudian doctrine of repression. I would, remi- I would remind you that the ideas of freedom and unfreedom within the subject as subjective qualities are both based on extra mental models. Freedom arose or was crystallized not merely by na- naively postulating an authority that dominates nature, which is what the ego turned into. It was constructed also as the positive counterweight to the experience of social coercion. In the light of the social coercion to which the ego succumbs, the self forms the idea that it would be better to be different, that it would be better to be free. In this web of delusion, it adopts a kind of compensatory role in the sense that, having once surrendered to external compulsion, it imagines that it can still define itself as a free being inwardly, a free being inwardly at least. This is an ancient, even archaic tactic you can still find it in all the ideologies, particularly those of a petty bourgeois kind.
these are still very widespread and can perhaps best be summed up in the idea of an inner kingdom of the kind cherished by the silent majority. This inner kingdom consists in the idea of an internal life that is supposed to be a haven, a haven of peace and quiet, largely independent of the factors that determine the external world. In reality, however, at the very point where such inner kingdoms are to be found, we also tend to discover that they are really a kind of rubbish bin, full of all sorts of elements of external life that take flight into the imagination, only because they are pipe dreams that have no prospect of being put into practice in the real world. But in the same way, unfreedom too, that is to say determination, has its extra mental roots. They are situated in the dependent circumstances in which the subject finds himself. Those of nature in archaic times that overwhelmed mankind, and then, and, and above all, the dependence upon social conditions, dominant groups, and cliques. These, I, these are hypostasized as internal determinants, and thus become a matter of human inwardness. To give you an example, you will find this mechanism by means of which unfreedom, inner unfreedom, becomes a sort of reproduction of external unfreedom in Protestantism. For Protestantism uses the determinism of the will to justify the subordination of the human subject to alien authorities. In other words, the ruler's will. You can see very clearly from this that the theory of the servum arbitri ar arbitrium that Luther defended against Mel Melanchthon is itself a reflex, an ideology or a vindication of external coercion, and that this kind of teleology was... or theology, sorry. This kind of theology was indeed concerned to produce a vin vindication of that coercion. The truth is that in contrast to these two illusions, these two illusory roots of both the theory of freedom and the theory of unfreedom, we should remind ourselves that the subject is not what it is explicitly called as recently as the phenomenology of Edmund Husserl, namely the sphere of absolute origins. Instead, we should remember that this view, that the subject could be the sphere of absolute origins, mistakes the ground of knowledge for the objective ground. In other words, the idea that phenomena are mediated by the subject, and that the subject can only come to know them by turning them into its own innate truths. The two propositions are almost tautologous. The subject thereby elevates itself into the sphere of pure origins. Even the definitions which uphold the subject's claim to sovereignty stand in need of what, according to their own self-understanding, ought to need nothing but them. One aspect of this is that the sphere of absolute origins of which philosophy speaks is secretly still the sphere of the subject. And this remains true, however much it speaks, as if it were located beyond the distinction of subject and object. Thought couched in terms of absolute origins of the kind we see in the, in the unambiguous thesis, the undialectical thesis, of both the freedom of the self and, and the unfreedom of the self, is based on the delusion of a subjectivity that falsely assumes that everything that exists can be said to have derived from it. Whenever we think we might have discovered such a sphere of absolute origins, what we find is that the absence of ambiguity, the identity that such a sphere assumes, in contrast to whatever is claimed to derive from it, or to be subsumed under it, turns out to be no more than the metaphysical hypostasization of the principle of identity, which is what the subject is. But whether the subject is autonomous in reality, whether it is able to decide one way or the other, as is imagined in the mechanism of the web of delusion, depends on the opposite of this subjectivity that has inflated itself into an absolute in this fashion. That is to say, it depends on objective reality. For it is this, the organization of the world, the nature of the world, that actually determines the extent to which the subject achieves autonomy and the extent to which it is vouchsafed or denied. Detached from this, the subject is a fiction, or else such a thin and abstract principle that it can be of no assistance in telling us about the actual behavior of human beings. Again and again in the history of philosophy, attempts have been made to apply the concepts of freedom or unfreedom to make definitive assertions about the actual behavior of human beings.
In particular, thought experiments, experimenta crucis, have been devised in order to decide unambiguously whether or not man is free and how to arrive at absolute decisions about the freedom or unfreedom of man. The best known, although slightly comical example, no doubt intentionally so, was conceived by the scholastics. It was the famous ass belonging to Buridan, which found itself having to choose between two identical bundles of hay. The question of which one, the question of which one it would turn to, which one it would eat or eat first, was supposed to be the proof of its freedom to choose. I believe that by their nature, by the way they are designed, these thought experiments undermine the very logic to which they lay claim. For they always strive to reduce the empirical context to the point where the example becomes incompatible with reality. All that is left is the abstraction in this case, or it is the abstraction in this case, the bundles of hay. But when you think of situations involving living people, they always turn out to be different. Such identical bundles of hay that are supposed to provide us with a test of free will may perhaps exist for asses. But even there, this won't happen often. For what farmer would take the trouble to provide his ass with two identical bundles of hay equid- equidistant from the animal, unless he has already been corrupted by philosophy? Nor will such things be discovered in the context of human society. The logical error lies, I believe, in failing to recognize that such a thought experiment would only be compelling in empirical conditions in which real people exist. While, on the other hand, as soon as you introduce a degree of reality into the experiment, you inevitably introduce elements that would deprive the example of its cogency. In other words, all the elements that come from empirical reality and that form the basis for rational decisions becomes arguments become arguments, motives for the human subject that has to make these decisions. This means that the determining factor this means that the determining factors come from outside, the very factors that ought to be stripped away on the grounds that the question of freedom in all these experiments is supposed to be an internal matter. This condemns these experiments to absurdity, to a pointlessness that will not have escaped you, but that we shall encounter again in Kant. I say this now to prepare you for the shock. I should also like to take the opportunity to point out that the epistemological problem I have sketched here recurs with experiments throughout the social sciences. The situation there is that you might create chemically pure conditions to enable you to explore some problem or other. Let us say the problem of human aggression. I have in mind here a particular experiment that our institute here in Frankfurt was involved in a few years ago. By the time you have done that, you have made certain decisions and thus reduced the available facts to the variables that can be strictly controlled, as they phrase it in the social sciences, with the result that the experiment will be so far removed from every possible empirical reality as to lose all validity. Now it is truly remarkable that Kant, in his eagerness to justify freedom and the validity of the moral law together with everything that goes with it, simply rides roughshod over all these objections, even though he must have been fully aware of them. Instead, he allows himself to undertake a whole series of such mental experiments. I shall, I shall read one of them out, of, out to you from the Critique of Practical Reason. It can be found in Chapter 1 of Part 1, the chapter on the principles of pure practical reason, and shall then comment on it briefly. Before doing so, I can perhaps point out that the examples Kant uses, and I think that such matters are anything but trivial, are all characterized by a peculiar irritation, not to say fury. This fury is aimed as much at the presumed subjects of the experiment as at anyone who begs to differ or who declines to be impressed by such experiments. We are speaking here of a certain philosophical tone that is to be found first in Kant. It continues in fict where it takes on what can only be called paranoid overtones. And regrettably, it is even to be found far more frequently in Hegel than Hegel's admirers would like to believe. The first example is as follows. Suppose someone asserts of his lustful inclination that when the desired object and the opportunity are present, it is quite irresistible to him. Ask him whether, if a gallows were erected in front of the house where he finds this opportunity, and he would be hanged on it immediately after gratifying his lust, he would not then control his inclination. 
One need not conjecture very long what he would reply, but ask him whether, if his prince demanded, on pain of the same immediate execution, that he give that he give false testimony against an honorable man whom the prince would like to destroy under a plausible pretext. He would consider it possible to overcome his love of life, however great it may be. He would perhaps not venture to assert whether he would do it or not, but he must admit without hesitation that it would be possible for him. He judges, therefore, that he can do something because he is aware that he ought to do it and cognizes freedom within him, which, without the moral law, would have remained unknown to him. If Kant can construct such a piece of casuistry, empirical casuistry, he must also put up with having it analyzed according to the rules he himself accepts. If we do that, we see that quite obviously his example won't stand up. It is not necessarily true that the immediate prospect of the gallows will deter men from obeying their instincts. I would remind you of the countless instances in the Third Reich where people offended against the race laws. They were not necessarily deeply in love and were often enough just acting on the impulse of the moment, only to find themselves subjected to a horrifying punishment. In the meantime, psychologists have long since shown that actions that lead to such punishments are themselves based on a motive, that of the so-called need for punishment that goes back to infantile fixations. Thus, in reality, things turn out to be quite different. Of course, you can say that all this is just psychobabble and does not have the least connection with the purity and sublimity of these furious thoughts of Kant's. But having proffered the example and having called upon us to accept it as evidence for the existence of the moral law as an effective empirical reality, he has no right suddenly to appeal to pure a priori propositions. He can't have his cake and eat it too. Either he must remain within the confines of the intelligible world, uh, with the consequence that his moral law would have no application to empirical reality, that it would therefore be invalid, or if he wished to include the relations of the mundus intelligibil intelligibilis to empirical reality in the scope of his argument, he would have to submit to the criteria that apply to that reality. In this instance, the supposed cogency of the decision is either no more than a function of the superego, in other words, something that is itself determined by other factors, or more likely, something heteronomous in the Kantian sense, namely something that simply follows its own self-interest and has little connection, therefore with a moral law. A further example is to be found a few pages later. Here, too, we see the same bizarre aggression, a psychologist would probably say that the punitive urge in Kant is so powerful that it always leads him to make use of abominable, abominable deeds as examples, so that by comparison with such crimes, his morality will show him in a better light and enable him to enjoy a clear-cut triumph. It was for reasons of this sort that Nietzsche criticized Kant. It would have been good for us to have been able to go into this question in depth, particularly since what is at issue is the true content of the formal imperative. And it would be valuable if we could really get to grips with the true meaning of this idea of the absolute validity of the imperative. However that may be, here is the passage in question. He who is lost at play can indeed be chagrined with himself and his imprudence, but if he is conscious of having cheated at play, although he has gained by it, he must despise himself as soon as he compares himself with the moral law. This must therefore be something other than the principle of one's own happiness. For to have to say to himself, I am a worthless man, although I have filled my purse, he must have a different criterion of judgment from that by which he commends himself and says, I am a prudent man, for I have enriched my cash box. I understand nothing of gambling as it was customarily practiced in the 18th century, when it had a very important social function. Just read Casanova and Manon Lescaut, you find people engaged in gambling the entire time. But I believe that we can say that it is highly unlikely that a genuine card sharp would bring himself to say, I am a worthless man. On the contrary, he will generally be content to believe that he is a clever man, or else that at least he is living in accordance with his own professional code, 
in other words, in accordance with what swindlers generally agree is legitimate or illegitimate. In all probability, he will think it wrong to cheat another swindler. All in all, he will manage things in such a way that he will never have to utter the words, I am a worthless man, a statement to be expected only in plays by Suderman, but unlikely to be found anywhere else. The true attitude of such a swindler is probably better captured by the anecdote of the burglar sitting in a pub deeply immersed in a newspaper. When a colleague asks him what he is reading, he replies with a straight face, I am just reading the review of my latest break-in. Here, too, we see that if you let your imagination roam a little and apply just a little psychological insight to these illustrations that Kant presents with such a plum, everything turns out to be quite different. As a final point, by way of criticizing these experimenta crucis, I should like to say that it is always assumed that the moral law has psychological force. Its validity is always presupposed, even though this a priori ineluctable validity is supposedly to be demonstrated by these examples. It is because of this circularity that these Kantian examples seem so curiously inconsistent and unconvincing. I have already remarked that burden-like situations are not often witnessed, just as card sharps are not in the habit of following up their actions with great moral reflections. They may indeed be extraordinarily moralistic, like criminals in general, but psychologists are well aware that their moralizing is always applied to other people whom actual criminals cannot condemn. Severely enough, while at the same time displaying a remarkable ingenuity in, ex in exempting themselves from the same strictures, I would say, and this is something that could perhaps be taken up by students of criminal psychology, that there are mechanisms at work here that seem to exempt them from a sense of their own guilt psychological mechanisms that are, of course, capable of explanation. But in that case, situations like the two contained in the Kantian examples I have told you about would be entirely irrelevant to the lives of ordinary human beings. A far greater interest than these experimenta crucis is the need to make use of such experiments to assure ourselves of our, of our freedom or lack of it. This need should not be dismissed as merely psychological. It has its own basis in knowledge. It testifies to the fact that, however much the theory of freedom or unfreedom aspires to achieve an a priori status, it nevertheless has something like the feeling or sense of its dependence upon the ontological, on actually existing reality. There is an a, an a priori here that forces people, philosophers, into these experiments, which are then doomed to failure. In the absence of any relation to empirical reality, of the kind that such experiments are supposed to generate, at least marginally, and if you look closely you can see that neither of these Kantian examples is lacking in empirical references. Without such a relation to empirical reality, all talk of freedom would be null and void. This is because there would then be no way in, in which we could imagine how freedom might manifest itself in reality, even if an intelligible character is ascribed to it. However, the moment empirical reality is introduced, it becomes a determining factor and thus impairs the principle of freedom itself. This in turn leads to a reduction or misinterpretation of empirical reality that deprives that relation of its fruit. The concept of the intelligible character, a very strange, even absurd, and yet not unconvincing concept, is one that asserts that people have an essence that enables them to act freely such that their actions represent the beginning of a new causal chain. On the one hand, while on the other it lifts them out of the mechanism of cause and effect in nature. The introduction of this concept, this extremely difficult and fragile concept of the intelligible character, is connected precisely with the problem I have been discussing with you today. It is the idea that, she will, that the will cannot, as in the tradition of these experiments, be inferred as an existing internal reality from the world of phenomena, but that it must be postulated as their precondition. And that involves all the difficulties of a naive realism of inwardness, the naive assumption of an existing inner world with its freedom or unfreedom. This is an idea which Kant subjected to a withering critique in other contexts. I have in mind his criticism of other reifications of mind, such as the indivisibility 
the indestructibility of the absolute unity of the empirical soul in the paralo- paralo- oh, fuck. paralogism chapter of the Critique of Pure Reason. In general, and perhaps I may throw this out to you as a suggestion for academic research, it would be a rewarding task to examine the entire theory, not so much of Kant's groundwork of the metaphysics of morals as of his critique of, prati- of practical reason, and to confront it with the arguments contained in the paral- paralogism chapter. It seems to me that in very many respects the critique of practical reason regresses to a point that the chapter on paralogisms had superseded. Nevertheless, I believe that something does emerge from Kant's experiments, and that is the reason, the substantive reason, not the epistemological reason, the critical reason, but the substantive reason why I have spent so much time and effort on these experiments and these Kantian examples. As I say, something does emerge from all this, and it is something of decisive importance for the problem of the will or unfreedom, for both in fact and without which all the discussions one can have about this topic have something rationalistic, something intellectual in the dubious sense. I hope I can use these words like this without running the risk of being misunderstood. It is as if the sphere of pure thought, I should like to give you a precise idea of this concept of the rationalistic or intellectual, as if the sphere of pure thought were directly and seamlessly identical with the sphere of action. In this sense, the Kantian theory is rationalistic. It is in this sense that it goes back essentially to the ideas of freedom to be found in the older rationalism, particularly the rationalism of the 17th century, where it always seems as if only the intellect is capable of lifting itself out of the natural context, as if it were only as rational creatures that human beings could raise themselves just one little bit above nature, and that men are only free because they are thinking beings, res cogitans. In contrast to this, these thought experiments, and I would like to return to the ass belonging to the worthy Buridan, bring us face to face with something new, something that has been elided in the intellectualist conception of the will that in Kant is really nothing other than pure reason itself. This something is what I call the additional factor, The decisions of the human subject do not simply glide along the surface of the chain of cause and effect. When we speak of acts of will, we experience a sort of jolt. The most basic example of this, the story Burden's ass, does in fact give us an inkling of this, when we consider that even the ass, stupid though it may be, still has to exert itself, to make a gesture of some sort, to do something or other that goes beyond the thought processes, or non-thought processes, of its pathetic brain. That is to say, it experiences some kind of impulse. I would almost say a physical impulse, a somatic impulse that goes beyond the pure intellectualization of what is supposed in the theories we have been discussing alone to constitute the will. And the memory of this additional factor that we shall have to discuss in some detail is preserved in these experimenta crucis.